we came up with a questionnaire that we sent to the audit partners. Okay. And we thought at the time there was some discussion, should we get IRB for this or not? And the idea was not really because we're sort of just asking them for their, um, for their opinions on something. We're not really, I, I mean, I, it's not really like a function of testing them. The analysis of the project isn't really about their results. Like if I was writing this paper about what did they say in those survey responses, and that was the focus of the paper, then I would say, okay, fine, that definitely needs approval. Um, but the thought was sort of like, it's just sort of an ancillary consultation almost. So we don't really need IRB approval. The problem is when we try to submit it to the journal, they felt that by asking them questions, because this was described as a survey. So let me show you here exactly what I'm talking about. It's this one, I think. All right. You guys can see this uh, document here. Yeah. All right. Um, so this is in the paper. This is not, it doesn't fit well on the slides, so it doesn't really work, but essentially this is what we gave them. Okay. So everything was filled out except for the final column here. Okay. Um, oh, hold, and we, hold on, hold on. We are, what we are seeing here is a cover of the document. Oh, okay. So that's the wrong, it's the wrong document. It's this one. Okay. Okay, you can see ah, this yeah. with the table. Okay, so uh, this this table was originally entitled um, Senior Auditor Survey, uh, which is why they wanted IRB approval. Um, so essentially, basically what we did was we gave them everything here except for the final column, okay? And we wrote what we, what we thought could go wrong, some potential problems, then we wrote the tests that we thought would test for these problems based on our analysis of the data. And then we highlighted audit objectives, some audit objectives uh, that this might target, right? Um, there were other ones that, you know, when we did more detail, we added more to this, but that's sort of our broad thing. And we divided them into some categories initially. Uh, we had some just general tests. We had ones that related to sort of timing issues with backdating, um, potential earnings management, um, and then we had some fraud and internal controls ones, right? So you were asking about employees' abnormal behavior. Uh, so this is like employee makes entries outside of their normal value range, right? Um, that would be an example of that, right? So that might be value-based, things like that. So we refined it a little bit, but essentially they were asked to give us a level of importance. And this is the combined results in this final column here. Right. So you have a high, low, high, high, medium. Um, you have some where it's sort of like medium and low for outside of business hours. Um, you have some where like aggressive earnings management is all high and one medium. Right. And then you have some where you're talking about repeating payment error or fraud. You have two people ranking it low, two people ranking it high and one person in the middle. Right. So there's some dissension there. Right, so we average these. We assign these a one, a two, or a three. Low for one, three for high, and we took the average of these. But basically, because we gave them this and we asked their feedback, the reason why we did that is because we needed a very structured environment, right? Because they were very busy people and they didn't want to have to dedicate too much to this. Um, we did it like this. The final section that we had, which is separated into the appendix at the bottom here, um, was room for them. It was on the same form and it was room for them to provide additional feedback. So because we did this, right, we asked them for additional feedback and it was really a collaboration in designing all of this. Like we didn't, the reason why we felt also that there was no need for IRB is because we didn't just design this survey instrument, so to speak, out of the blue. We actually collaborated with them in conjunction with them to design this because basically the issue was we need their feedback, but they're too busy to just sit on the phone with us. So how can we provide them with some way of giving us the conversation without re requiring them to be on the phone at a specific time for a specific length of time? 
So the solution that, that they worked with us was to come up with, give us a document that's showing us what you're thinking and we'll evaluate that. So we felt that it was a collaboration more than a survey. Now, the issue was we started to think of it as a survey. So in the paper, we called it a survey. So when we submitted the paper, they asked for IRB approval, but we sort of backtracked and said, all right, well, really, this was a collaboration. Um, it wasn't so much as specifically a survey, right? It's not like we designed this and then we asked for volunteers to come out and take our survey, right? Uh, so that's sort of why we felt like we were able to get around that. But I would say if there's anything that you would loosely describe as a survey in the future, just go for the IRB approval. The worst thing that they're going to say is you don't need it. It's kind of a headache to do, but it's better than getting all the way to the end and realizing you might need it. Is that good, Professor? Yeah, yeah. I, I just wanted them to be aware that there is this thing called IRB. And uh, just historically, uh, during the, after the Second World War, they ran some experiments in Yale, whereby uh, they basically were seeing if you, if you, they told you to do something really bad, the boss, uh, or, you know, in this case, in the war, you would do it, just obey. And they created tremendous storm at the participants after a while. And so finally, people decided that for using any experiment with humans, you would have to uh, obey certain guidelines. And then became a big bureaucracy in, in universities. Mm -hmm. Some universities deal with it reasonably lightly and nicely, but some of them have horrendous bureaucracies. We, we had a case a little while ago maybe five, six years ago, Danielle's dissertation, and took them like five months to respond to us. It was horrendous. Yeah, so that's why you try to avoid it. But yeah, the idea is that they want to make sure that you are being independent, right? Because it's like in a lot of these studies, you have to compensate them, but you don't want to compensate them too much and skew it all. So there's that. But then mostly it's like Professor said, to make sure that everyone is coming out of the study relatively like okay and not like damaged from it um so uh basically this gave us this final list of filters based on their suggestions and what we worked with them on um we broke it down into these categories ones that pertain to data entry ones that pertain to timing ones that pertain to the preparer right and then ones that were sort of other they didn't fit into another category we linked each test to an audit objective, and then we told the reader what glare risk category it fit under, right? Because the glare framework says basically look at the data, analyze the data, that will inform what categories you can kind of work with. Based on those categories, we're going to suggest a bunch of tests that are designed to examine these particular problems. Okay, so these are the tests that we got from that. All right. Um, I'm not going to go through any of them, but the only ones that I really want to highlight on this was when I spoke about how you might have a multi-staged filter. That's what we're seeing here with backdated and advanced um, records. So a backdated record is basically um, I'm entering the record today, but I should have entered it last week. So I'm going to enter it today and then I'm going to put a date from last week on there. Advanced entries is I'm making an entry today but I should be making it next week. So I'm entering it today with next week's date in it, right? And there's a way for us to tell because you can compare the date it was put in the system with the date that it was effective, okay? And so when we looked at those, we found that there were some issues, but we wanted to look more at earnings management because that was something that they said, right? That was the biggest concern here, earnings management. So we wanted to look for ones that, for example, if I enter it today and we just changed into quarter three, right? Or into a new financial year, right? If I enter it on January 5th and I backdate it to December 25th, that would be a concern, right? Because it should have been a, it should have been in the last financial period, but it's in this financial period that I'm making it, right? Or if I'm entering it on January, I'm sorry, on December 25th and I'm, I should have entered it in January right? That can lead to earnings management. So if I'm, for example, entering all of my um, revenues right before the revenues that I'm supposed to be getting in January, I'm booking them in December. And then all of my liabilities and expenses from December, I'm booking in January, that would be managing the earnings up. You understand how that works? 
or what we ended up finding was the reverse. They were booking a lot of expenses early and then a lot of revenues they ended up backdating to the previous financial quarter. So they were managing down and it's less common, but there are reasons why you would do that. Okay. Uh, so we had those. So, so we had the regular ones and then the ones that we defined as earnings management risk, which were around a financial period cutoff. Okay. So the next thing that we have here is a sufficient scoring system. Essentially, this is a complicated mathematical formula that's telling you something very simple. Um, you're just summing up. So for a particular filter, right, what is the score for a particular filter? That's equal to um, basically a one or a zero if it violates the filter times the weight of the filter, right? And then you sum that up for every filter. So every filter has a weight. If it violates the filter, you assign it a one. So one times the weight. So you're basically applying the weight to it. Um, and if it doesn't violate the filter, you give it a zero. So then it's not going to apply to that particular um, record. All right. Um, this was the final output that we have here. I'm not going to go into too much detail. The results slide is going to talk about it. Basically, we have the tests. These are the weights that we came up with. Uh, this was just based on judgment, based on what the auditors kind of told us was important and not important. Um, sometimes like we had situations where, um, you know, because one in a journal entry, you might have multiple accounts that are impacted by a journal entry. Okay. So a journal entry occurs and you might have three different accounts that are updated in the general ledger because of one journal entry. Okay. So as a result, there were certain problems where if we found that one uh, account in the journal entry was one account update was problematic, we wanted to say that because of the, the fact that both sides of a journal entry, the credits and the debits have a balance, if there was problem with one side of the journal entry, there was likely going to be problems on the other side of the journal entry, whether we detected that or not. So... Um, we thought that we were going to add in a bunch of multi filters with that, right? So if one particular account update was missing a description, all the other records in the journal entry got a small suspicion associated with it. Okay. Um, so we, we have a few of those over here. Um, we have the number of records that actually violated a particular filter. Um, and then that, that is represented in the final column of the portion of the population, right? So the real ones that you want to look at here, for example, um, description, right? All of the updates, the general ledger were required to have a description of what was causing the update, right? That was an internal control that was violated. So 67%, almost 68% of the time, uh, there was no description. So that would be a material violation of that internal control. Okay, so that is showing you right there that an internal control was violated. Another one is duplicate entries, right? So four and a half percent almost of the total population was duplicated, right? An exact match on all of those different variable fields, all right, which is problematic. It doesn't mean that it was definitely a duplicate, but it is very suspicious that they would be that similar, all right? So that might be a violation of an internal control. Um, other things that I want to highlight are, um, you'll see them more in the results section, things like uh, backdating records. So if you look at these that are earnings management risk, right, um, you can see that 0.03% of the time you're having advanced entries or 0.51% of the time you're having uh, backdated records. Those are occurring at a very low rate. So the likelihood of you detecting it using a statistical sample is very low. So the question is, is this even material if it's occurring at such a low rate? And when we get to the results section, I'll tell you that some of these advanced entries were in the highest valued amounts of journal entry or of, uh, general ledger updates that we saw. So they, they, they do have some material impact, even though they're happening at a low rate and we were able to detect those. Okay. Um, and then you also have something here like multiple names. So that would be another internal control because it should only be one employee that's making the update and that is functioning perfectly, right? We didn't find any issues with that. Um, the final step before I discuss the results in detail was to determine um, how we were going to draw our sample, right? So we knew that we wanted a sample of about two to 300. And the question was, how do we determine that? Because if you look here, if we take all the records that have a suspicion score of 13, we end up with 25 records, 
Okay, so we want more than 25. So if we take all of the records that have um, a score of 12 or 13, we end up with uh, 549 records, which is way more than we want, right? And then how would we choose out of this 524, which ones we wanted? It becomes a new sampling problem, right? So instead, what we did was we put a filter for materiality, okay? So we applied multiple different materiality filters. We found that 3,000 worked. So we're only looking at record updates that are worth $3,000. Anything less than that, we said, well, didn't really matter. And when you look, we can go all the way down to a suspicion score of nine, which is what we did. And then we came up with a population of 203 records. Okay. And that's by summing the 198, the two and the three. And that was our sample. Professor, Professor yep. uh, could you please give me some more details why you choose like $3,000 for the that Um. So essentially we thought about what would be material given the average value of the entrance and all of those things, which is in our data slide, I can go up and show you. Um, we actually started with much higher numbers, but then we realized that um, that makes up like the population was like uh, polarized. So there were some values that were super high and some values, like a lot of values that were kind of low. So we felt that, um, if you, if you started at like a higher number, you were cutting out too much of the population already. Uh, so essentially what we did was we went, uh, we tested what we ended up with by like just doing random testing. We ended up with, I think we tested between one and 10,000 and we started going up by a thousand dollar increments. And when we got to 3000, we felt like this was a reasonable kind of cutoff. So in this population of, 203 there's some very big value some very low value uh we felt like we included a majority of the population in this um and essentially we anything that was lower than 3000 really couldn't be very material right because it's <laughs> such a low amount like most materiality thresholds for a company this big would be much higher than 300 3000 so we figured that since it was so low like it's better to go low than it is to go high and when we started the lowest, like 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, we found that 3,000 was perfectly fine to use. So that was the cutoff that we used. Hi, Professor. I, I have a question regarding this materiality thing. Because, mm -hmm. because after you apply the sub-filtering, the, the, the transactions with highest suspicion score are filtered out. So, so how about adding the another, uh, adding the amount as, um, how about including the amount into the suspicion score rather than adding it as a separate field? Yeah, so we did include in the suspicion score an amount. Um, that's the last test we have here, unusually high value. So if it was in the top 1% of value, we wanted to make sure that it filtered towards the top and did get some additional score. Um, and so we did include that in there, um, but we still needed some way of narrowing this down. And this is a problem that's faced every time ads is applied. How do you make a differentiation for a reasonable sample size? Uh, now, I understand what you're saying about the most suspicious records being left out, but there are sort of two um, ways that that sort of gets dealt with. So one is when you're making an audit assessment, and you're issuing your final opinion, you're not saying that it's free of any defects, you're saying that it's free of any material defects. And even if you were to say that these were all worth $2,999, and you multiply all of these by 2,999, that total value is still immaterial in the scope of the total value of the audit. Okay, so even if these are all completely problematic and fraudulent, it still doesn't breach the overall materiality threshold of being a bad audit opinion. The other thing is um, these are individual updates to the general ledger and they are linked to through journal entries. Some of them are going to be linked to records that did make it into this final population. So even though this particular 25 records wasn't tested, they may be linked to additional records that are represented in this sample here. So we do potentially still test some of these. Yeah, I see. Thank you.
no problem. Yeah, professor, I have one more question. So uh, when you uh, just checking the number of the suspe I mean, number of the sample based on the suspicious score, then I believe that the, the score would be like, and least it follows some like normal distributions, normal distributions, but when you see the like suspicion score uh, for two uh, greater than $3,000, then it, the sample, the number of sample is pretty much like lower than other, other samples compared to like suspicious score one or three. Is there, did, did you find some reasons why that? The, uh, the we didn't really the look into it. There was like a, when we were mm -hmm. looking at how to group these, to figure out where to do it. One of the things that we try to do was we applied a bunch of clustering techniques to try to cluster all of these to see if there was some pattern. Like when we cluster them by suspicion score, is there some type of pattern of behavior that occurred? Um, and there was really no uh, discernible pattern. The only pattern that we found was that a majority of, and I mean, I guess you kind of expect this because of the additive nature of the suspicion score, mm -hmm. um, a majority of the most highly ranked issues, right? Like the ones that really received high suspicion scores um, appeared in a group that was usually, the cutoff for the most suspicious group was usually around five. So as long as we included some records above a suspicion score of five, we knew that we were going to get the most suspicious records, um, anything below that. I mean, this could be just like general mistakes. Why be mm -hmm. two instead of one? I'm not really quite sure. Um, my only thought could be that, um, there was not a lot, like there was not a lot of filters, for instance, that scored a two, right. There was really only two. Mm -hmm. Um, and then there's a lot of random ones in there. So the likelihood of you ending up with even numbers is a little lower. So that's why you can see when you look at here, uh, when you compare them, I guess in the bottom half of this, the even seem to be a little lower, I guess. I don't know. Um, but I didn't really give much thought into why two is any bigger or less than one. Cause I figured, you know, you must've only violated one or potentially two filters, which is not really a big deal in the scale of like all of these scores. Plus I don't know what the value of these are. I mm -hmm. can't imagine they're very high. Um, okay. so yeah, we didn't look at that though. That's not a terrible idea to look at. Cause I didn't actually notice that until you just brought it up now. Mm. Okay. Got it. Thank you. So can I also ask a tiny question? I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I know you've been on the slide for a while. Um, the nature of these, uh, scores, whether it's the, um, the sort of weighting of each problem or the suspicion score in aggregate, um, I've been trying to figure out if they could be considered like a, like a ratio variable where uh, a, a 10 is twice as suspicious as a five or uh, a weight of two is twice as um, like dangerous of uh, a filter as a one. And I feel like the answer seems like not exactly. And I was hoping you could clarify a little yeah, bit. Yeah, so this is the first that I'm really thinking about it like that. And the answer in, I would, uh, I would say is no, because there for two reasons, basically, you don't know how it got to that score, right? Did it, did it get a lot of ones because it was associated with some bad act records? Um, or, you know, did it get some high numbers to get to that? Right. So, so you can't really make that judgment, right? You could have a six because it violated two records very seriously. Um, or it could have, a six because it violated a lot of filters a little bit, right? Like, and then that's an auditor judgment. What's more important, violating two seriously or violating one six times, right? So even within a particular score, assessing what is more or less, I mean, there's a, a, a variable, like not every six is essentially equal, right? So then to compare a six to a 12, that becomes even harder. Um, the other thing is assigning these scores to get these numbers, is already a subjective step, right? You're not saying that, you know, it has to be like, a, if, if a different auditor at a different firm were to go through this process, they may give completely different weights to all of these different things uh, based on their assessment. Now we try to average that out by getting five senior audit partners, which is more than you would ever have on a real audit doing that. And we got them from different firms and different backgrounds. Some of them had experience with this industry, some of them not so much. 
So that sort of played a role into all of this. So the answer, because it's subjective, how you get these weights to begin with, in my opinion, would be no, you can't do any kind of like additive assumptions or understandings based on that. The only thing that you can really understand is because it's a higher number than another number, there must be additional risk. Right. Essentially <laughs> seven smaller risks is still more important than two big risks that only add up to six. It, yeah. Uh, um, two minor responses to that though. Um, I wonder how this sort of looked if instead of a one to three scale, it was like a one to five scale, uh, more granularity, but also I wonder how this would look if you had some sort of combo multiplier uh, where violating more filters had a cumulative effect that could be read numerically in the suspicion score. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. So that's something that the suspicion scoring research sort of is trying to grapple with at the moment. I don't know, professor. I don't think on any of the Mads tests they did that. That's not a bad idea, though. No, it's that's a very a good idea. idea. My very only, good idea. my only concern with that, my only concern with that is you may end up running into a situation because you're doing it that way that there are some records. So one of the advantages to doing this is you have um, you the ability to detect low frequency, high risk problems, and part of that is. So if you go here, if I'm backdating a record that is worth, say, a million dollars, for instance, right? And I'm only backdating it, but it is like misrepresenting what's going on. And in order to try to make it look legitimate, right, so that the auditors don't discover what I'm doing, I make sure that everything else is good, right? So if I'm committing like a fraudulent entry or something, I'm only going to be violating one filter the likelihood of that fraud getting detected is now lower because I'm intentionally making sure that everything else is correct. It seems to me that that is a, a very relevant concern. But it's um, rare. That's not a bad idea. Look, look, I, I think that's a pretty good idea that you've come up with, but that would be my only concern with it is that right. ones that are intentionally low number violations um, might not get picked up or it only violates one or two things that are very serious problems, it might not get picked up as easily. Because then, of course, violating seven filters at a low level is more important than, or six filters at a low level is more important than violating, you know, two threes, for instance, because you have that, a multiplicative effect. I think that that taps into um, my, my other comments of how the disparity between low and high weights is not that large, um, mm -hmm. especially given the concern of uh, people who may be limiting themselves to a very small number of uh, violations specifically to avoid detection. If these extremely uh, potent filters weren't a three, oh, but worth it a five, um, that would make them show up anyway. Yeah, really really that. Cool. yeah. No, that's a good point. I, we didn't really give much thought to the numbers in the waiting. Um, to be honest, we just figured, well, we did a low, medium, high. We'll kind of, but that's not a bad idea. That's not Steve, bad. Why don't you, why don't you write like a couple of paragraphs on this idea, send it to everyone. And maybe Jamie might want to write a paper in that direction. Yeah, it's not a bad one. And it's definitely something that Mads in general hasn't considered. It's a good idea for it. Yeah, it's a very good idea. Yeah. Thank uh, you. No. Uh, any other questions on this slide? Yeah, yeah, Professor. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I have a follow-up question, follow question about the weights of the uh, filters. So, mm -hmm. um, um, so you, here you just said one, two, three, right? And to represent low, medium, and high. So, um, so uh, if there is one filter that is extremely important than others, so for example, you can set the weight to one, two, and five. So why do you want to choose just a numerical order? So maybe you can use, use some um, technologies like uh, regression or other um, things to set the weight. Right. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. So we basically pick these weights because uh, we use the methodology similar to what um, other MADS approaches had used. And we did it based on uh, two factors. First of all, um, reading and interpreting the data. 
So based on how many we're violating and the values of those numbers and things like that, we were like, okay, this is sort of evaluating how important this actually is. And we combine that also with the information that the auditors were giving us. It wasn't an exact mapping, right? We didn't, we didn't um, do it particularly like the auditors felt this was important. Like, no, we felt like, you know, for example, duplicate entries, this got a fairly middle of the road grade from the auditors, but we gave it a three, right? Why did we give it a three? Well, we felt that um, the auditors didn't say it wasn't important, right? It is important and it's important on two levels. It represents a financial impact if you have a lot of duplicates and it also represents an internal control failure. So we actually are exploring two things with one filter, right? So that's why we figure because it's testing multiple things, it might be a little bit more important, right? So we sort of use judgment. I mean, is there a way to remove judgment from it? Um, maybe, that'd be great if there was. Um, I'm not sure what you could do or how you would do it, um, but I'm definitely open to suggestions, but we sort of just use judgment to come up with these weights. And before we applied them, we also met with the auditors and we were like, do these seem reasonable? And they were like, yeah, that's fine. So it wasn't just like, we just said it and that was it, right? Like we did kind of verify that. Any other questions on this? Yeah, Professor, um, I think I missed it. How, because before you were um, asking, the, um, asking the firms to decide on um, how important the, um, the what could go wrong is, and then you had a wait for the what could go wrong. And now here is the um, actual filters. So okay, so those weights are going to show up in the results because we use those weights to evaluate our results. So they said that the most important issue was backdated entries or earnings management. So then the question was, so we used it a little bit here, okay, because it was so important, we focused on earnings management here, we designed filters for that but we use that to evaluate our results. Did we discover any potential earnings management or not? So those issues that they thought were most important, we talk about in the results to say, did we find these issues or not? And then if the answer is yes, like we did find earnings management, right? It was happening, there was high value, or okay, I can't say with certainty it was happening, but it was, it looked as though the pattern of behavior was there that it was happening, right? You need to do some more substantive testing to know for sure right? Which we couldn't do, but it looked like it was happening. Now that was the most important thing that they wanted to look at. Okay. Uh, it looked like it was happening. It looked like it might be material because there were high value amounts that were associated with that. But the question is, would that be detected using traditional methods? And the answer is maybe with judgmental sampling, maybe not, but with statistical sampling, highly unlikely because this is ha happening at a rate that's less than 1%. Now it still might be material based on the values we're talking here in, in terms of millions of dollars, but it's happening at such a low rate that it's likely not going to be detected using any statistical sampling. And so that's why we use that auditor evaluation score to basically say, these were the problems. Did we discover these problems? How prevalent were these problems? And then basically use that to prove that this methodology or to try to show that this methodology did a better job than the older methodologies of detecting the problems that they actually cared about. And um, we were able to show that using the data, right? So we were at least as good as the old methodologies in detecting the problems, but in some cases we were actually better at doing it, right? So I can't say with... 100% certainty that you wouldn't detect earnings management in statistical sampling, but at less than half a percent or about half a percent, it's very unlikely that you would. And that even if you did, you would make that connection because in order to make the earnings management connection, you would have to see backdated entries and you'd have to see advanced entries together. And the likelihood of you even detecting those two things existing is so small together. Right. So that's why we use that, um, their evaluation of low, medium, high. It gave us some insight into the weights, but primarily it was used for evaluation. Other questions? Okay. So uh, basically, the results, the first result we have 
is this on this last line here. So over half a million records had no suspicion score associated with them. Not to say they were totally problem free. There might've been issues that we weren't testing for that might've existed, but based on the assumption that we were testing for all the major issues, they were problem free. And that's a piece of information that no um, previous sampling methodologies could determine. You would never be able to tell with 100% certainty the exact number of records that had no issues. You could make a statistical extrapolation, but you're never going to get the exact number. Okay. We were also able to tell that two particular problems that we were looking for occurred in 0% of the population. Okay, which is, again, not something you can do with statistical sampling. You do a statistical sample. You can say, I didn't find it in my sample, but you can't say with 100% certainty it didn't exist in the population. But we can do that with this particular thing. So that in and of itself is, is a result. Then we looked at it based on materiality. So what I mean by that, we, look, we, at, we talked with the auditors. They said... Uh, you know, they usually use materiality thresholds lower than this. They were kind of all over the board. We picked a high materiality threshold so that we set the bar really high, the standard of proof really high, and we picked 10% materiality. So uh, basically what I mean by that is here, you know, you may have some records that occur at a low frequency, but they're high value, which might violate 10% of the overall value of the general ledger, or you might have ones that are consistently occurring at a low value, but at a high rate. Okay. Like for example, duplicate records or something like that. All right. And those, um, that's how we would see it in total. Did that violate the materiality threshold? Um, we found a few. So, uh, this employees filter, for instance, um, we found that, you know, if you look at this test right here, inactive employees, okay. It, it occurred at a high rate. Uh, so that's an employee that's no longer with the company. So the, the data was from the general ledger data was from 2014 and the employee list was from 2019. So if the employee left in that five year window, we said that there might be something suspicious. Now, the employee might have left just because they took another job, right? People leave for innocent reasons. But we wanted to look at also there might be cases where an employee was fired for a particular reason for performing badly. So we wanted to look at those. Now we couldn't make a determination of why they left or whatever, but this was basically our proxy for those additional employee filters that we wanted to run. Okay. So it was sort of the proxy we had for that, um, that violated the filter, right. And that was interesting because that was much higher than the population average three times higher. So why are these people that are leaving entering values that are so much higher? It just seemed a little weird. Again, it's not saying that there is a problem, you determine if there is a problem by looking at that sample of 300 and uh, doing your substantive tests on that and figuring out, you know, exactly what's going on. Okay. So you can see here, right. That there are a very high value of those ones that violated that filter, almost 50% of this 13% were um, a very, very high value. All right. But anyway, we had duplicate records that represents a failure of an internal control. Um, oh, another one here was um, that violated materiality is intercompany transfers. So within a company, you might be transferring between accounts. Uh, again, that's normal, but it occurred more than we sort of really expected. So it's something that an auditor might want to look at. Again, it doesn't prove that there's any kind of problem. We're not saying that there is a problem. We're just saying that there's some weird behavior there. Okay. So we have duplicate records. Uh, again, that's an internal control one. Um, we have this management situation that I've explained to you guys with the backdated and advance records. Um, and so we basically looked at this, um, from the auditor standpoint. Now this again required even more filtering. We looked at these backdated records and advance records. And when we compared it to the chart of accounts, we found that predominantly revenue accounts, were the ones being um, advanced dated. So, uh, sorry, were being backdated. So, and then predominantly liability counts were being advanced entered. So that's downward earnings management, right? Why they wanted to do that. There's some reasons it seems weird. Uh, it also seems weird that they would do it from quarter one to quarter two and from quarter, um, 
sorry, at the end of quarter two and at the end of quarter four, I guess for mid-year and end of year information. Okay. Uh, any questions? I'm not going to go. I think this is the end of it. Oh, there's a limitation slide here. Uh, basically it's only one firm and it's not all the data sets from the same year. Those are the biggest limitations that we had. Um, and then in future research, you should just look at this in different industries, different size companies. This may vary. I don't know. It's just standard stuff on this. Any questions for the end of yep. this? Yeah, Professor, I just wondering how you get the data. You already, you know, mentioned in the paper that you got the data from the external auditor. So did you ask the auditors to get the data? Yeah, so the radar initiative is working with all these big companies and like the audit companies, and they sort of pitched this idea like, okay, we wanted to do MADS. Uh, Professor No came up with MADS. We wanted to apply MADS to all these different areas. Um, so you guys have to cough up the data so that we can use it for this kind of stuff because some of the MADS projects use data that was publicly available, but general ledger updates because of the nature of where it fits in that diagram I showed you at the beginning, it's considered more sensitive information. So companies don't release that to the public. So the only way we could get it, uh, was basically through the company itself or through the external auditor and the external auditor, um, one of the big four basically said, here's an audit that we do of a foreign company that's multinational. Um, they're willing to let you use the audit data from a previous year. Um, we weren't really allowed to communicate with the company. Uh, we were allowed to communicate with the audit team that was involved in this audit, um, but it was kind of hard with that. We sort of just did it all independent. And of course, I mean, this isn't going to be in the paper, but um, one of the things you have to be that I learned on this, I had, so I just as a piece of information for you guys, so I'd worked on prog progress uh, projects, sorry, with internal auditors and then with external auditors, like with this. And I found that when you work with the internal auditors, um, they're a little reluctant to give you data. I don't know if it was the company we were working with or what. They're a little reluctant to give you follow-up data. So you find problems, you tell them there's a problem, and they don't always follow up with you on what happened, right? Maybe they don't want to admit what's going on, whatever. Uh, with the external auditors, there's a lot of pushback. So we found these problems. Um, they were not necessarily willing to admit that we had found a problem, right? Because that could have major impacts for them and, you know, reissuing the audit and all this kind of stuff. Uh, so we did not get a lot of feedback on most of what we found. We did not get any kind of follow-up or really them to admit, like for a long time, you know, I call it here in the paper because now they're not really associated with it, uh, duplicate entries, right? For the longest time, we weren't allowed to call them duplicates because they were worried that if we found duplicates, they didn't do their job properly. So we had to call them suspiciously similar records, right? So these are kind of the things you have to think about when you're working with these external auditors. They're giving you data and they're giving you information to help you. Um, but there is going to be situations where like you're not going to get proper follow-up or things like that. Thank you so much. No yeah. problem. Uh, let me just make a comment about this. Uh, we, in the VEDA project, there were eight firms and they all were supposed to give us data. None of them did except this particular one. And one gave us a database of hospitals that uh, Erica and Lou are working on. Uh, so we are very grateful for they doing this. And actually, I don't know if you remember, Jamie, uh, it actually went the following way. Um, uh, the the person who was at the radar group, the partner, talked to the manager, to the CFO, I would imagine, there. And uh, they, basically, um, they basically said, oh, uh, talk directly to the firm because they didn't want EY, uh, the firm, to be involved directly. Uh, but we finished up actually using the data that the CPA firm had. Um, and uh, the data was a big mess, correct, Jamie? 
oh my God, this data was like, and then to get them. And then at one point we were trying to talk directly to the audit client and then they got very upset with us. And then it was a whole mess. And then we couldn't for a long time, like you, we needed the chart of accounts for a lot of this stuff. And then they were giving it to us and then they weren't giving it to us. It was a nightmare to get all of it. And then there were problems with the data when we first got it too, if I'm not mistaken. There were big problems with it when we were given it. Uh, reading into it, figuring out what was going on. In the end, what we ended up doing, if I'm not mistaken, at one point was we had a call with the auditors that actually did this audit um, to sort of explain yeah. to us what was going on and to help us out with some of the issues we were having. And at the end of our calls, we still were not totally sure they did. Oh, anything. yeah, no, yeah, yeah. And then every time we found something and we were trying to get it, there was always some kind of excuse. I mean, you can't blame them, right? They don't want to admit that they did anything wrong, but. Yeah, meaning uh, I, I don't think I would blame them. And actually, I think they, 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 what they got and what they did is beyond the state of the art. Uh, it's just that the audit evidence is just so skimpy. And meaning this has come comes from, auditing standards 40 years ago when you did things by hand and the trade-offs are such that uh, you know you what what do you gain by finding something i mean you gain nothing you lose a client so yeah i mean we we had that discussion uh professor where um remember we, we, were, we were gonna write something on um the difference between internal and external audit and how like the standard that they use for like, if you go to a big audit firm, like an EY or something like that, and you ask them to help you can help them consult with your internal audit, the standard they use for that, and they'll admit this to you, the standard they use for that is way more stringent than the standard they actually use because they don't want to find problems, right? There's like a conflict of interest. And they also don't want to do something that's new and interesting because they're worried it's going to violate some kind of standard. Uh, so they're just scared to, and, I don't know, Professor, I reckon that they do use a little bit more than they make us aware of, or they do find things a little bit more than we realize, but they don't admit it because they don't want to. Mm. I don't think it's yeah. much more, but I think that, yeah, I think you're right also. I mean, it creates more audit work. The more problems you find, the more, um, even if there is no issue in the end, there's more that you have to do to follow up, right? That's a higher cost. Yeah, and, and, and it comes down to what, Jamie said in the beginning, is, uh, uh, you know, with a 300 sample and a population of million, you really don't understand what the data tells you. And it's like uh, luck if you find anything that you really needed to find. It's very, very random. You know, think about it. Three, uh, divide 300 by uh, a million and you'll come up with a very low number. And uh, so uh, I think that that is a major need for totally rethinking what an audit is and what's the purpose of the audit and how do you do it. Uh, we yesterday did a presentation uh, to the PCOB. Maria was there. And so I can show off a baby presenting. So it was great. Um, but we, I was very disappointed. I don't know how it was Maria's reaction. Is, is they, we got no questions, correct? Maria, we got three questions. And the three yeah, questions... Yeah. Are, the questions are pretty basic about the... Like they don't understand um, what's on supervised learning, then they ask, but not about the fundamental. Yeah, but they took us for that... Uh, they, they use us for training inspectors, right? Like this mad stuff, we taught the inspectors at that training thing. Remember, Professor? Yes, I did. Uh, so I did. they are trying to do something, but I think the biggest problem is there's no regulation forcing auditors to do this. Maybe they don't understand, like you said, Maria, maybe maybe it's just uh, ignorance about what's out there. I wouldn't be surprised, but I, I my understanding of the situation is, you know, if the kids aren't being taught it on the CPA exam, well, that's, the first problem. And then the senior auditors, this is way beyond anything that they may be aware of or familiar with, especially at like mid-size firms. And then, you know, some of them even lack, you know, like um, I used to go and meet with this um, 
conglomerate of mid-sized firms and help teach them stuff. And basically for them, it was just like, look, we want to do this stuff. We know that it's going to come, but we can't even afford to hire the right people or to learn the material as much as these big, big firms can, you know? So, so I think professor's right. You got to completely rethink the way that it's done. Yeah. Well, so yesterday I put this pitch in and the pitch was an experimentation program like Maria is working on uh, with Peninsula and what we are doing with the Teachers Community Bank. And the idea is that the CPA firm, uh, client, us, and some element of the regulator do audits in a more modern way. And I always say the rules for taxi don't apply very well for Uber. The rules for hotels don't apply very well for Airbnb. Why would the rules for a traditional manual audit apply well for a digital environment with dig digital transformation? So um, I wanted to do an experimentation program with the PCOB, uh, but I, they didn't have anyone there that I could really have this discussion. Uh, but I'm not giving up uh, because uh, I think we, we can get to the right people if needed. So yeah, but that's... here's my pushback on that, Professor. Okay, I'm not saying back. you're wrong. I'm just saying to play devil's advocate. Uh, if you have one set of rules, like you have one set of rules for Airbnb and one set of rules for hotels, that's the way it ended up working out. Now that works because in those business models, there's a demand in each of those different markets. But here, if you make one set of rules for new auditing and one set of rules for old auditing, which you might have to do, right? Because smaller firms and mid-sized firms Maybe they can't afford to do the new techniques, but if you make two standards that way, then what incentive do the bigger firms have to do to swap over to the new standard? Why wouldn't they just stay with the old standard? Or do you just make everyone swap and then have the small and medium-sized ones that can't afford to drop out of the market? 